Thank you for joining our church online. We encourage you to visit citylightla.church for our service times, location, and upcoming events. If you enjoy our videos and would like to give to lives being changed in Los Angeles, visit citylightla.church slash give. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, if you have a copy of God's Word, let's open it to Matthew 5. If you do not have a copy of God's Word, I would encourage you to take one of the black hardback Bibles out. Uh, there's uh, located in a seat rack in front of you, and the page number is uh, six, seven, uh, 760. 760 will get you right to Matthew chapter 5. If you don't own a Bible, we want to gift you with that Bible. Let's put that in your life, in your hands. Take that Bible home as our gift to you. We would love to put a copy of God's Word in your life. We're looking at two paragraphs today as we're going line by line, paragraph by paragraph, through the Sermon on the Mount. This is a sermon that Jesus preached at the beginning stages of his earthly ministry, a crowd of people was beginning to follow him. Miracles were being done. His popularity was beginning to grow. He just got done spending all night on a mountain praying to his father. And he comes down the side of that mountain. And he comes to this plateau on the side of the mountain. And he begins to teach this crowd of people. And from this crowd of people, he selects his 12 disciples who did much ministry with him for three years of his earthly ministry. But he's teaching not only his 12 disciples, but he's also teaching this crowd of people that were no doubt searchers, no doubt maybe some skeptics, some, some people curious, but those that were beginning to follow Jesus with their life. And he's teaching them what life looks like in the kingdom, what life looks like as kingdom citizens. Those that have placed their faith in Jesus are now citizens of heaven. They're now citizens of his kingdom. We have not fully experienced his, his kingdom yet, but we are part of his kingdom. We may have a citizenship of another country right now, but ultimately, above all those citizenships, we have a citizenship of heaven sitting upon our lives. We, we are his citizens, and he is our king, and he's teaching us what life looks like in the kingdom. We, we divided this Sermon on the Mount into three sections. Part one was lessons from the master. We looked at the first section of chapter five, looking at the Beatitudes, and we are finishing up part two today that we titled Life in the Kingdom, and next week we'll begin chapter six and move through chapter seven as it takes us through our summer months together, unpacking line by line, paragraph by paragraph, the Sermon on the Mount. In preparation for this week's study, I was no doubt drawn back with the topic to my, to my childhood. I'm the youngest of four boys and raised in Las Vegas. Much of our life was raised by a, a single mother and four boys that were very, athletic, very much into sports and very much into uh, sibling rivalry and very much into competing who's better and very much into fighting and everything that boys tend to do. And I got four daughters, so girls do it too, but everything that boys tend to do also. And, uh, and I was reminded of, of retaliation in our home and how as the youngest of the four boys, eight years was my oldest brother apart from me, seven years my second brother, and three years my third brother. And the youngest one there always doing what a young brother does, picks fight with the older siblings, right, and sees how far they can go to antagonize them, see how far they can go to get away with, with abusing them, see how far they can test the limits. And no doubt, retaliation and pain of retribution was part of our home. Getting even was part of our, of our home. And my mind was brought back to one story, how my, my third oldest brother told me, if I do this thing one more time, how I'm going to face some consequences. And I thought there's no way he's going to get me because I'm the littlest one, right? Like I can get away with murder in this home. I'm the youngest one here. But at that day, he was very much just on edge. And he told me, Nick, if you do it again, I can't remember what it was. I tried to remember this week. I almost called him. I don't remember what it was. And I don't know if he even would remember. But he said, if you do this thing again, I'm going to shoot you with my blow dart gun. And I thought, like, that's, that's like child abuse, okay? You won't do that. So I, 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 I did it again, no doubt. I tested him, and sure enough, he ran to his closet, and this blow dart gun was like this long, and you put a little dart about this big in it, and you shove it through there, and you blow through it, and you could shoot that thing on a line. And sure enough, he told me, Nick, if you do it again, I'm going to shoot you. So sure enough, I tested him. He went to his closet, and I said, oh, my goodness, he's real. I ran down the stairs of our tri-level home and ran out the front door screaming crazy blood or bloody murder across the front yard, across the neighborhood street, and sure enough, he comes out the door as my next brother is laughing his head off there, and he shoots the gun, and out of my peripheral, I see this dart flying, and sure enough, it stuck me right in the shoulder blade, and I start screaming for dear life, and I learned that day, do not mess with him anymore, because he's a jerk, okay? <laughs> so we don't have to train our kids, we don't have to be trained on how to retaliate, we don't have to be trained on how to make people pay retribution for what they've done. That is something natural we do. You mess with me, I'm gonna get even with you. And Jesus understanding that, Jesus knowing that's part of our human fallen nature, the, the idea of, 
of, of getting even, the idea of getting back, the idea of relational tension where we harbor feelings of, 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 of anger and animosity and I need, a, I need to get even with that person. I need to somehow do something in order to make them pay for what they did to me. And Jesus here wants to address this issue of retaliation and of retribution in our, in our relational connections that we have in our lives that we live in his kingdom. In order for us to see that, we want to look at God's word. We'll be in verse 38 down to verse number 48 this morning. This is not what I have to say. This is what the king has to say. And we want to simply just re-deliver something that he delivered 2,000 years ago and pray that the spirit of God grips our heart this morning because it has the power to change us in some incredible ways. Let's see it this morning. Beginning in verse 38, you got your Bible out. I got my Bible out. I'll read aloud. You follow along quietly. Let's see what the king has to say this morning. Beginning in verse 38, he says this. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than the others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The big idea sitting over these two paragraphs, which is really for us our sermon in a sentence that we like to give for us to jot it out as we're journaling and taking notes this morning, is this right here. Life in the kingdom is lived counterculturally in the face of evil. I believe the thesis that Jesus has given to us, the, the main point that he wants us to see this morning from his teachings, is that life in the kingdom is lived countercultural in the face of evil. I believe the heartbeat behind Jesus here is that, that bracelet that became popular, I think it was in the 90s, where it had WWJD on it. Maybe you owned one of those. Maybe you still own one of those. WWJD simply mean, meant, means, what would Jesus do? And what we're going to see this morning is that the king is helping us understand what it looks like to resemble him as we live life in the kingdom. What does it look like to have the mindset, what would Jesus do in the face of evil? How would Jesus respond here to this evil that he is facing, to this retaliation, to this, this desire for retribution? How would, how would Christ respond? Life in the kingdom is countercultural in the face of evil. So the question we want to ask this morning is this, what does, counter, what does a countercultural life look like in the face of evil? What does a countercultural life look like in the face of evil? Now, what I see is I see three traits of, of character, that, that characterize a life that is living countercultural in the face of evil. Three traits that characterize a life that is living countercultural in the face of evil. Now, in verse 38, you're going to see Jesus begin here with an Old Testament command. You can find this command in Exodus chapter 24 and verse number 20, uh, Exodus chapter 21, verse number 24. You can find it also in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse number 21. And the command is simply this. It's quoted. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now this was something that they would have known, something they would have understood. This was where the wheels of justice turned on the principle of payback. What we must understand, though, is that God gave these guidelines to govern civil and criminal justice. Now, there are three reasons this law was given by God to the people of Israel. First of all, it prevented the judges in the courts from issuing a punishment that was too severe based upon the crime that was done. It was an eye for an eye, not, not you take one eye, you lose two eyes. It was, a, it was a, an equal punishment based upon the offense that was done. The second reason it was given is to prevent retaliation from the community that you would trust the, the courts and the judges in order to issue the sentence instead of you living as a vigilante trying to take justice into your own hands. The third reason it was given in, is in order to ensure the society that if they committed an offense that they're going to face the consequences according to the offense that they did. Their consequence is going to be equal to the offense that they committed. So Jesus here in this, in this beginning here was not prohibiting. As we walk through this, 
he's not prohibiting the administration of justice. But rather, he's forbidding us to take law into our own hands. He's forbidding for the law to be taken into the hands of those that are in the community. An eye for an eye is a principle of justice belonging to the courts of law. Now, there have been some through history that have taken this part of the Sermon on the Mount and used it to promote the removal of all law, the removal of authority, the removal of punishment, the removal of government, the removal of force by police, and the removal of prisons. What we understand is this is not what Jesus is referring to. That's why Paul, later on in Romans chapter 13, verse number 1 through 7, teaches us that governing authorities have been instituted by God for the purpose of punishing evil and protecting the society. That's why he says in Romans chapter 13, verse number 1, what's interesting is right after Romans 12, where he teaches us to, to not retaliate and not to, not to uh, punish our persecutors. Then he goes into Romans 13 and talks about the institution of government. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, Romans 13, 1. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Then later on in 1 Peter chapter 2, 13 to 14, Peter writes, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil, and to praise those who do good. And so here Jesus has not given a call in this Sermon on the Mount for there to be the removal of authority, for there to be passivism, for there to be no consequences by law, for there to be no judges, simply here... He's wanting us to understand that there's not to be uh, retaliation. There's not to be uh, you going and retaliating or, or, or going after an eye for an eye in your everyday relationships and interactions. This is relational based. This is for us in our interactions as we go through, at you and I, as we relationally live life in the kingdom. Yet in this time, many, though, were applying this principle. The audience here that Jesus is addressing, they were applying this principle in a way that was abusing it. They were applying it in a this for that style of vigilante justice. What they were taking is the power that was intended to be given to the courts and to the laws was being taken into their own hands and inflicting personal retaliation and still thinking they were righteous because they were following the, the law. Yet what we see here throughout the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5 is they were abusing the law and taking what was given to the judges and the courts and using it for their own personal vengeance on others. So Jesus here, he, he urges his listeners to respond to personal offenses with grace and mercy. This is what we're going to see as we walk through this. He's going to unpack this for us. Jesus is stressing the need for his kingdom citizens to decisively break the natural chain of evil action and reaction that characterizes human relationships. So what he wants us to see is that life in the kingdom is to be lived counterculturally in the face of evil. What you're going to notice today is this is not cultural norms that he's going to give us. It's countercultural, but it's what our king has given to us as his kingdom citizens. So three traits that characterize, that characterize a life that is lived counterculturally in the face of evil. I want to give you each trait in a sentence format, and each one is going to begin with a statement. I am living counterculturally when. I am living counterculturally when. Number one, the first trait we're going to see is this right here. I am living counterculturally when... I endure with generosity to my opposers. I endure with generosity to my opposers. Notice what he says in verse 38 to 42. This is what he wants us to see. Enduring with generosity to our opposers. He says it like this. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I'm saying to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. So in verse 39, after quoting the Old Testament, he's now saying, I'm saying to you. We've seen him do this multiple times as he's referenced the Old Testament, but now applies it to his kingdom citizens in the new covenant. I am now saying to you, it's an authority statement. Moses said, but now I'm saying. He says in verse 39, do not resist the one who is evil. Now, the word resist there has the idea of, of opposing, of going against, of retaliating. So when you see that word, highlight it. I'm not opposing. I'm not going against. I'm not retaliating. And he says, don't oppose the one who is evil. Now, as you read this, maybe you're thinking, doesn't the Bible tell us to resist evil? In fact, it does. So is there a contradiction? Aren't we supposed to oppose him who is the evil one, also known as Satan? And all the powers of evil at his disposal. In order for us to correctly 
understand exactly what Christ is saying here in the context. We have to understand the word that he is using for evil, the gender of the noun being used with the word evil. The word evil is in the masculine gender, not in the the neuter. Jesus is referring to an evil person, one who is evil, the person who wrongs you. Jesus does not deny that he's evil. He's not trying to skirt around the fact that he is an evil person. So he's not not denying that he's evil. He's asking us neither to pretend that he's other than he is. He's evil, nor nor to condone his evil behavior. But what he does say is do not allow this person here to, to take revenge. Do not take revenge on someone who wrongs you. Do not go after them. Do not oppose them. Do not go against or retaliate against them. And then Jesus follows this up with four mini illustrations that drives home the point of what he's saying. You're going to see these four mini illustrations through 39 to 42 that are driving home the point of what he's making. That's why he says in verse 39, the first mini illustration, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now you may read this and you may ask yourself the question, is Jesus against self-defense? I quote one of my favorite commentators, John Stott, who says it so well, Christ's illustrations that he gives are not to be taken as the charter for any unscrupulous tyrant, ruffian, beggar, or thug. His purpose was to forbid revenge, not to encourage injustice, dishonesty, or vice. True love, caring for both the individual and society, takes action to deter evil and to promote good. So with that thought in mind, we see nowhere in Scripture where we are instructed to be submissive victims to physical, verbal, sexual abuse, rape, terrorism, murder, or any other threats of true harm. And so Jesus here is not talking about sitting back passively as a bully uh, uh, delivers, uh, injures, or attacks a defenseless victim, nor as a criminal breaks into your house and tries to kidnap your kids. He's not trying to say, just lay back and, and, and let them take advantage of you. So what do we do with this first mini, mini illustration? If someone hits your right cheek, turn to him, the other also. What is Jesus trying to give us so we can understand the great links he's trying to teach us to go to in order to refuse to retaliate? Now, Jesus could have meant a physical slap or he could have not meant a physical slap. But with that in mind, Jesus does say a slap on the face. Now, it would have been understood here in this culture that if a right-handed person struck you with a slap, it would have been a backhanded slap on the right cheek. And in this culture, a backhanded slap on the right cheek was one of the deepest insults you could possibly receive. And he says, if you receive this deep insult, then give to him the other cheek as well. So I believe the heart of Jesus here is that we would be people that resist the urge to fight back when we face the deepest of insults. That we refuse it, that we would resist it, that we would go to great lengths to resist the urge, to oppose, to attack, to retaliate, the urge to fight back when we face the deepest insult. And then he says in verse 40, the second illustration, and if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Now we don't know for sure if there was suing going on for tunics here, but Jesus here is definitely driving home the point. Now a tunic was an undergarment that would be worn under your clothing. And he says if they try to take your tunic, be willing to give them your coat also. The cloak is a coat. The cloak would have been an outer garment that was much heavier. It would have been used for keeping you warm. It would have been used as a pillow to lay on. It was something of great value. The tunic would have been made of less material. It would have been lighter. It was an undergarment. It would have not been as valuable. But the cloak would have been made with more material, more fashion, more design. What it would into it. You wore it over your clothes. And so what he's simply given to us is if they try to take the tunic, which is not as valuable, be willing to give them even your cloak, which is very valuable to us, to to you. So, So the simple illustration here is that we are to be people who give our best to others who are trying to take from us. Be people that go to great lengths to try to give your best to others that are trying to take from you. And then in verse 41, his third mini illustration, and if anyone forces you to go one mile... Go with him two miles. Now, they would have known exactly what he's saying here because in this day, Rome was taking over the, uh, the, the, the Israelite country, and a Roman soldier, by law, could order a civilian to carry his military baggage one mile. That civilian had to stop what they were doing, no matter what it was, and carry that Roman soldier's baggage 
one mile. That was what the law demanded them to do. And so here he says, the law says go one mile, but go the extra mile. This is where that phrase comes, go the extra mile or go the second mile. Go beyond what the law requires you to do. The law says go the one mile, but I'm telling you, go beyond what the law demands in order to serve that person who's opposing you. Verse 42, he gives us the fourth illustration. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now, poverty would have been very prevalent in this culture. It would be very common to see those begging on the streets for for needs and for food and for for money in this society. No doubt it would have been something they they would see on a regular basis. So simply put, what Jesus instructs his followers to do is to do more for those in need instead of avoiding those in need. And so Jesus is using these these four illustrations in order to help his audience and to help his kingdom citizens understand the, the great links they ought to be willing to go to, to serve and to care and to love instead of to try to retaliate. That's why the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse number 14 writes, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. And as we engage with these four many illustrations, no doubt you feel how countercultural they are. They were countercultural in the time period that Jesus is speaking, and they've always been countercultural. These are not normative behaviors. But Jesus here is speaking to, to citizens that are, that are now aliens in a foreign land. We're living in exile. We belong to a new kingdom. We have a new king. We have a new leader. And he's saying, this is how my kingdom citizens are to live as they're living on mission in exile as my kingdom citizens. And then our king is calling us to operate differently with a whole new set of standards because we are citizens of another kingdom. Now, each of these commands requires Jesus' followers to act more generously generously than what the letter of the law demanded. That's why he says, go the extra mile. Hey, go beyond, do more. Not only must disciples reject behavior motivated only by a desire to retaliate, but they also must positively work for those to whom they are otherwise be at odds with. So not only rejecting a, 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 an attitude of retaliation, but actually going and positively doing something for them and going beyond. That's why he says, hey, give them your cloak if they want your tunic. Go the extra mile if the law says go one mile. Hey, that beggar, that, that person in need, give to him. Don't try to avoid him. Hey, this is how my kingdom citizens operate. This principle that Christ is teaching his followers is deeply rooted in being Christ-like, isn't it? It's the very mind of Christ that Paul would instruct the church in Philippi to have as they live on mission for Jesus as his kingdom citizens. In Philippians chapter 2, if you recall, Paul teaches us to have the mind of Christ. He's writing to a church just like City Life Church in the, the, the city of Philippi, and he's writing to them to have a love that is characterized by the love of Christ. And he says in Philippians chapter 2, in verse number 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or, or, ambition or conceit, but in humility... Count others more significant than yourselves. He says in verse number four, let each of you look not only on his own interests, but also on the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Have the mind of Christ Jesus. And then he says what this mind of Christ Jesus is. Verse six, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He was God. He was the creator of the universe. He formed everything that was formed, the Bible tells us. He was in the glories of heaven, but he did not hold on to it. He emptied himself. This is the incarnation, God in human flesh, verse 7. But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So Jesus, he did not look after his own welfare. He emptied himself. He emptied himself to, to pursue those that were undeserving. He emptied himself to to save sinners. And Jesus here modeled this mindset that that he's now given to us to have in in verses 38 to verse number 42. The life of the Lord Jesus demonstrated a God-focused man that chose to please God before self and who cared more for the needs of others before his own needs. Jesus was a man who delighted to do the Father's will and could pray in the most grueling of circumstances in the garden, thy will, not mine, be done. And so what we see in verses 38 
to verse number 42 is our king instructing us to live in a way that he first modeled. That's why in Romans chapter 15, in verse number three, it tells us that Jesus did not live to please himself, rather he was willing to bear our reproaches on himself. Jesus, the Christ, the one teaching here, he took the blunt force of our sin's penalty upon himself. Jesus first endured with generosity to his opposers. Jesus was the first endurer of generosity to those that opposed him. You say, who are his opposers? We are his opposers. Those of us that are now in Christ were his opposers. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, Paul d- d- describes the state of the unregenerate person, those that have not been made alive in Christ. He says in Romans 3.10, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood and their paths are ruin and misery. The way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's our depravity. That's our fallen nature apart from the redemptive power of the gospel. We are the opposers of Christ. We had no desire for him. We had no love for him. We had no interest for him. Apart from his grace, we would be dead in our sin, Ephesians chapter 2. But Jesus pursued his opposers. He endured the betrayal of this life. He endured the the pain of this life. He endured the crucifixion he faced. He endured the, the mockery he faced. He endured the torture he faced generously because he loved us. So we are called to have the mindset of Christ. Jesus emptied himself of his heavenly position and took upon flesh. He lived the perfect life we could not live. He died the death that we deserve to die. He didn't die for his sin because he had no sin. He went to the cross and he defeated death and he defeated sin through his resurrection and he rescued us from our depravity. And those who come to Christ in faith are no longer of this world for we've been born again into a new creation and have been imputed with the nature of Christ. Now we are called to become imitators of him. What Jesus calls us to become, he empowers us to be. What Jesus calls us to become He empowers us to be because he indwells us when we come to faith in him. The the creature of the, the creator of the universe became human. Think about that. He lived in poverty. He was tempted on every level yet without sin. He was beaten, betrayed, mocked, and ridiculed, and willingly went to the cross to die for his opposers. How much more generous can you be? He endured generously for his opposers, and we are called to imitate him as we live life in his kingdom on this earth. So life in his kingdom is lived counterculturally in the face of evil. The first trait that characterizes a life lived counterculturally in the face of evil is I am living counterculturally when I endure with generosity to my opposers. Now the second trait I see here in verses 43 to 45, number two, I'm living counterculturally when I relate to my enemies graciously. I relate to my enemies graciously. He says in verse number 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your father who's in heaven. Now the final antithesis here given to us is the first with a quotation not entirely found in scripture. Now here, when Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor, it comes from Leviticus 19.18. This was a command given in Leviticus 19, love your neighbors. But the command that he quotes, hate your enemies, appears nowhere in the Old Testament. You will not find one time God say, hate your enemies. That was never commanded to the people of Israel. So loving your neighbor was understood. It was was attainable. For the, the Jewish people, a neighbor would have been their their fellow kinsmen, a fellow Jew, a a brother. It was their people. It was a people that looked like them, a people that thought like them, people who had similarities and commonalities. With that in mind, though, we must look at something that is obviously glaring from us from the text. The sentence here, love your neighbor, quoting Leviticus 19.18, is missing a key phrase there in Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19.18 says, love your neighbors as yourself. 
Now, loving your neighbor as yourself, that raises the bar to a whole new level because each of us love ourselves. We defend ourselves, we sacrifice for ourselves, we serve ourselves, we care for ourselves, we try to beautify ourselves, we care for ourselves. But here, that was obviously taken out through the translation, through the time. So it's missing the phrase that emphasizes the kind of love you're to have for your neighbor as yourself. But not only is it missing a key phrase, it adds a phrase that appears nowhere in a command in the Old Testament. Hate your enemies. And Jesus says, you have heard that it was said. So obviously the rabbis and the religious leaders of the day were, were teaching this to the people. And Jesus here steps in the midst of them and he addresses something here where they conveniently left out an important part of loving your neighbor as yourself, and they conveniently added, hate your enemies. And Jesus here is uh, addressing this, the the loss of translation throughout the interpretation. This reminds me of the years when I was a a youth pastor for about five years, and and we would oftentimes break open our our uh, youth groups with a, an icebreaker, a crowd breaker, and we would we'd get the group on one side of the room, and we would we'd have them whisper into an ear, and we'd put them in a long line, and then they would whisper in each ear down the line, and you get to the last person that had their ear whispered into, and you'd say, "What did the first person say?" And they completely slaughtered what was said. It's like you would begin with something like, "I love tacos," and it would end like, "I want to go to Tongo." Like, no, I don't want to go to Tongo. I love tacos, right? Like, like something was missed there in the translation. So what we see here simply and obviously is they manipulated the law and they diminished love for their neighbor and at the same time they elevated hate for their enemy. So there's a diminishing of love and an elevation for hate. Is not this what is a cultural norm in our society? Diminishing love and elevating hate? And Jesus follows this up with this. You've heard it being taught. You've heard it said. Some of you believe this to be true. But I'm saying to you now, your authority statement, I, I, your religious leaders have said this. But I'm the authority now. I'm saying to you under my covenant uh, as my kingdom citizens, verse 44, I'm saying to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Now the word love, we got to understand, is not referring to an emotional love or to a sentimental feeling. It's not this emotional attraction or their sentimental ooey gooeyness. It's none of that right there. It's, it's the word used here is the word agape. Now, in the Greek language, there's three words to describe love. The, the word agape is the, is the highest form of love. Agape love is used most often in Scripture describing God's love for sinful humanity. It's the love that is unconditional and a love that is sacrificial. In this passage, the word love is the verb form of agape. The noun, the noun is agape and the verb is agapeo. Agapeo is the word used for the word love in verse 42. It's a love that does, does what is right. It's a love that, it's a verb. It's a love that acts. It's a love that responds. It's a love that does what is right and best for someone, even if it involves negative feelings. It, it's a love that cares for, serves the needs of, and sacrifices for another. It's a love that comes from the will rather than the emotions. It's not determined by the beauty or desirableness of the person. It's a love that is deeply connected in the will. You act for them. You move to them because it's the love you're commanded to have from your king, Jesus the Christ. I say all that to say not to sound smart, but rather to help us understand the weight of what Jesus is saying. We got to understand the weight of what he's speaking to this crowd. Understand the weight of what he's calling us to be. Jesus is instructing this crowd of people and he's instructing us today that citizens of his kingdom are to show the same kind of love to their enemies as God the Father has shown to us through Jesus Christ. We got to feel that this morning. We got to feel the weight of the instructions because it's so easy for us to come come up with scenarios and excuses and reasons and offenses why someone doesn't deserve our love. Why we should retaliate, why we should hold a grudge, why we should hold on to that bitterness, why we should keep back good from those people. But we got to understand what Jesus is calling us to be as his kingdom citizens, that we are to love with the same kind of the love of the Father. We are to love our enemies unconditionally and sacrificially as God himself loves sinful men. And no doubt, family, as we're looking at this, the crowd would have been trying to decipher what kind of enemy Jesus is referring to. I mean, is this, it, it, I mean the, kind of, the kind of love for your kinsman, a fellow Jew, a brother, your people is challenging enough. I mean, it's challenging enough just to love those closest to you, isn't it? But now you're, now you're calling me to go a step further, and now you're telling us that we're to love our enemies with a sacrificial and unconditional love that moves towards caring for them? I mean, Jesus 
what's the level of the enemy we're supposed to love? Like, like where's the wiggle room here? Like, like, there has to be an offense someone did to me that doesn't demand my love for them anymore. And then he says in verse 44, pray for those who persecute you. I mean, it's hard enough to pray for people you like, isn't it? And now he's telling us to pray for, for those that are, that, are, that are persecuting us. And no doubt the question began to rise in their minds. I mean, put yourself in the seat of this audience. Okay, this is a real sermon with real people, not sitting in an air-conditioned building, but sitting in a hot Middle East with the sun baking on them, and they're feeling the heat of the sun and the heat of Jesus' words at the same time. And he's speaking to them, and he's telling them, and no doubt they're beginning to question. There has to be some level of offense where an individual becomes so great an enemy that we're no longer responsible to love them or pray for them. I mean, Jesus, are you telling me that I'm to love and pray for the Roman soldiers that are occupying my country? Are you telling me that we're to pray for the enemy even as they're persecuting us? Feel the weight for a moment. And I imagine that this crowd of people would have no doubt found themselves trying to splice and dice up what Jesus is saying, trying to find wiggle room to cheat the system, just like they did with the topic of anger, lust, divorce, oaths, and retaliation. I mean, we all try to do it. Try, where's the wiggle room here, Jesus? Like, where can I still remain right with you, but still kind of cheat the system a little bit? And he is as clear as clear can be. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. What Jesus is saying is countercultural and goes against everything our flesh naturally wants to do. This is so countercultural that for many of us, no doubt we come up with our list of scenarios and people who've offended us that cause us to think there's no way I can love them and pray for them while they have harmed me or have harmed me. Our minds automatically go to scenarios and offenses that somehow exclude us from having to love that person who has harmed us. And may I just encourage us today to get the heart of what Jesus is saying. We would do well to stop trying to find wiggle room and scenarios where this command doesn't imply. Instead, we must submit because this is the way of our king, and this is the way of his kingdom. So what do we do? We start with the smallest offense, and we work our way up to the largest offense. And there's no offense too large or too massive where this command of Jesus does not fit. We live counterculturally when we relate to our enemies graciously. Now here's the reality for these first century Christians. They would be entering into some very hard years because history tells us that Rome was on the verge of taking over their country. In a few short decades, 80, 50, 80, 60, and then 80, 70, Jerusalem was overthrown and burned to the ground, the temple destroyed. They faced severe persecution under the relentless rule of Rome. But not only would this crowd face persecution from Rome, but when they'd become a Christian, many of them would have much tension in their Jewish relationships between family and friends and neighbors to the point that some had to flee the country. They would face rejection, they would face insult, and for them to become a Christian was a welcoming of persecution because their leader was hung on a cross. So surely they wanted to be like their leader who also was persecuted. The call of Christianity, the history of Christianity, we must get this right because we don't fully understand this in westernized Christianity. The history of Christianity has not been that of peace, glory, and glamour. It has been quite the opposite. And many Christians throughout the globe are living in quite the opposite right now. And the call to love is not just your neighbor that looks like you, not just the person that thinks like you or votes like you or has the same color of skin like you or lives in the same social class as you or does all the same things you do. The call of Jesus here to love is not your person that looks like you only, not the person that thinks like you only, not just your neighbor, but the call of Jesus is your enemy. The call of Jesus is that we live in a way that we, that we relate to our enemies graciously. Yes, we endure with generosity to my opposers. If he wants to hit me on the right, take the left. You want to take my tunic, here's my cloak. You want me to go one mile, I'll go two, I'll go above the law. You want to beg something from me, I'm not going to avoid you, I'll give to you because I'm a Christ follower. I relate, I relate with people in a, in a, in a generous way. I, 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 I endure with generosity to my opposers, but now, now I relate to my enemies in a, in a gracious way he wants us to see. I love what Bloomberg says, commentator on this passage. He says it, and I quote him on the screen, the true test of genuine Christianity is how believers treat those 
whom they are naturally inclined to hate or who mistreat or persecute them. The true test of genuine Christianity is how believers treat those whom they are naturally inclined to hate. So often we have hate in our hearts. So often we hold grudges. So often we retaliate. So often we want retribution. But the true test of genuine Christianity is how, true, how believers treat those whom they are naturally inclined to hate. Then he says in verse number 45, he follows it up in verse 45. Notice what he says, so that you may be sons of your father who's in heaven. They may be sons of your father who's in heaven. Maybe for you, you feel insulted when someone says you're just like your dad. Or maybe it's the characteristic. Maybe it's like, you look just like your dad. You're like, I don't want to look like my dad. But maybe you feel complimented when they say, you work just like your dad. Maybe your dad's a hard worker. Like, I don't know whether you feel insulted or you feel good when someone says you're just like your dad. But here, this is supposed to make you feel good. Your love is so genuine and so authentic, you deal with people in such a gracious way that you're just like your father in heaven. We become the sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ, and we demonstrate whose sons we truly are when we exhibit the family likeness. Like some of your dad's short. You got no hope, dude. Short man for life. Okay. Big booty, big gut. Ain't going no. Sorry, man. Listen, man, there's some family likeness we ought to have in, with our Heavenly Father. Amen? This is what he wants us to see, that we would be called sons of God. I think Luke puts it so well. Luke also records the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, he does it in his own writing style. Luke 6, 32 to 36, he says it like this. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. This is a call from Jesus for us to be like our Heavenly Father, and it's a command that he gives. This command of Jesus, again, points us to the same love and grace that he so freely bestows upon us, doesn't it? We were his enemies. We were his enemies. And yet he relates to us, not according to our offenses, but according to his grace and mercy. Therefore, we are called to imitate our king and to relate to our enemies graciously and mercifully. I'm thankful this morning that Jesus doesn't relate to me according to my offenses, because my offenses are many. And he doesn't want to relate to you according to your offenses, because your offenses are many. The word of God is clear that every one of us have sinned and fallen short of God's standard. And because we have fallen short, there's a price to pay, and it's the punishment of God's full wrath for all of eternity. But Jesus did not deal with us according to our offenses. Jesus dealt with us according to his grace. That's why he came down and took upon human flesh. That's why he lived the sinless life that we could not live. That's why he went to the cruel cross and died the death that we deserve to die, not paying for his sin because he had no sin. He paid for our sin. Then he went into the grave and rose again the third day, defeating death and defeating sin. So all those that come to him by faith will be covered in, uh, by his blood of their sin and will be credited back to their account, his perfect righteousness. So no longer we have to face the consequences for our sin. No longer are we under the condemnation of God for our sin. No longer do we have to try to earn our way to heaven, hoping we get there one day if we're religious enough. The price is paid by Jesus. Jesus is the example of relating to us, relating to his enemies, relating to his opposers with grace, not with wrath and judgment, and he's calling us to imitate who he is. May our community know who Jesus is because we live like Jesus, amen? I'm living counterculturally when I endure with generosity to my opposers, when I relate to my enemies graciously. I got one more for you and we'll be done. Number three, the third trait I see I am living counterculturally when I love all patiently and equally. That's what he says in verse 45, part B. He, he, he describes to us the heart of the Father. He wants us to see it. Jesus is expounding here, going deeper. He says in verse 45, For he makes his son, the son, to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. 
For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not only the, even the Gentiles do the same? So in verse 45, he begins here at that last part of verse 45, describing the common grace, the common grace that God gives to all humanity. Common grace means that God treats the just and the unjust with benefits. The just and the unjust get to enjoy the sunshine, amen? Aren't you glad for SoCal sunshine? That's why we live in 900 square foot houses. For the sun, right? It's addicting. We need it. I mean, the reality is this morning that the just and the unjust both get the benefit of sunshine. The just and the unjust both get the benefit of the sun shining so their crops can grow. The just and the unjust, the, those worshiping false gods in, in pagan countries and in unbelieving countries and unbelieving villages all across the globe, those that, 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 that have hatred for God even in our own city, those that have no desire for God, those that would raise their fist to God and say, I'm an atheist, I believe there's no God. God still gives them sunshine. Aren't you, I mean, if I was God, I'd say, bam, you're gone. But I'm not God. That's called common grace. And God sends rain upon the just and the unjust. What does that mean? He treats all people equally. That's the grace of our God. Those that hate him, those that have no love for him, those that reject him, he still rains down his blessing on them. He still gives them oxygen in his lungs. He still gives them another day to live. That's common grace. He's showing us the heart of the Father here, that we are to love all patiently and equally. And then he says here, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have in verse 46? It's like even the tax collectors do that. I mean, the tax collectors were like the lowest of the lowest. They worked for the Roman government, they abused the system, and they stole money. No one likes the IRS. You're an IRS agent, we don't like you, okay? No, I'm just joking, we love you. Like, no one likes the tax. I mean, in this day, though, like, I got, we got our view of IRS, but in this day, the tax collectors abused, mistreated, stole, and they were doing it to fund the, the, the wickedness of the Roman Empire. So even the wickedness of the Roman tax collectors, even the wickedness of tax collectors, they even love those who love them. And then he says, he says, even the Gentiles, the word Gentile, the picture there is even the pagans, even the unbelievers. They even love those who love them. Like, like, that's natural to love those that love you. But you and I are called to love those that don't love us. The just and the unjust. You know, I think about the, the, the words I wrote down here that are glaring off this. Is our love ought not to be reserved for exclusive people. Our love ought not to be reserved for exclusive people. Just those that are nice to us. Just those that treat us good. Just those that haven't wronged us. Just those that have been kind to us. No, all. Patiently and equally. That's why he closes in verse 48. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. You must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Now, you say, what does that mean? Does that mean I need to somehow reach some sinless perfection where in order for me to get to heaven, I can have no sin in my life, like I never have to sin? That's impossible. He's not talking about sinless perfection or perfect righteousness. Perfect is not in reference to sinless perfection. Rather, the context here shows that the perfection he means relates to the love he's speaking of. The perfect love of God, which is shown even to those who do not return it, ought to be the perfect love we have shown to those that do not return it to us. Love, all, patiently and equally. I think about the person who modeled this so well, and her story no doubt will echo through history and has echoed through history in some incredible ways, is a girl that we named our second daughter after, Elizabeth Elliot. Elizabeth Elliot is an incredible woman, if you never read on her, but her husband, Jim Elliot, had a burden for the uh, country of Ecuador, but more specifically a people group in Ecuador called the Aka Indian tribe. And the Aka Indian tribe were, were a very violent tribe. They were warned that they were violent. They killed people. They were pagans. They were heathens. They worshiped false gods. Stay away from that tribe. But they had a burden, and Jim Elliott, along with Nate Saint and Roger Yadarin and Ed McCauley and Peter Fleming, five men, boarded a plane to go fly into that village there and reach this unreached people group called the Aka Indian tribe there in the country of Ecuador. 
After working for many years to establish a relationship and training and preparing, they landed that plane and almost immediately they were murdered on that beach side and spared to death by this tribe of people. No doubt Elizabeth Elliot's heart sunk as she writes about through Gates of Splendor. But she had a burden still for the Aka tribe. She felt God telling her to go back there and reach them. So she went back to Ecuador with her, her daughter Valerie and took her daughter Valerie and herself and they went back there to that country and they lived amongst a, a people group there not far away from the Aqua tribe and sure enough after a little bit of time they were able to establish a connection and make plans to go back to that tribe and try to bring the gospel there. Now think about this, her husband was just murdered by that tribe and she brought with her her little three-year-old daughter Valerie and Rachel Saint with, went with her also, who Rachel Saint was the sister of Nate Saint who was killed on that island. They went there and they were able to establish some connection and ironically the party arrived on October 8th, 1958. What's interesting is that was Jim's birthday and that would have been Elizabeth Elliot's fifth wedding anniversary at Jim. They arrived in that village and they began to work with that people and they began to see the gospel transform that community and to this day there's an entire group that had been changed by the gospel, even the ones that murdered her husband came to saving faith in that tribe. When she was warned by the people not to go there, you should not go there, Elizabeth. Don't take your three-year-old daughter with you, Elizabeth. They could kill you and do horrible things to Valerie. Rachel, do not go there. Why would you go there? This is a, a group of people that are not worth reaching. They're bad people. She quotes in her writing, she would respond to them this way. And I have it for you on the screen. As long as this is what the Lord requires of me, then all else is ir irrelevant. Then all else is irrelevant. As long as this is what the Lord requires of me, then all else is irrelevant. I close with this quote by Mark Clark, a preacher and writer. He says this, the word disciple occurs 269 times in the New Testament. While the word Christian is only found three times. In other words, the main presentation of Christianity in the Bible is not one who simply believes a set of ideas, but one who follows Jesus as Lord, teacher, and leader. And if all we are is Christians that have a set of ideas that we hold to, but we're not submitting to Jesus as Lord, teacher, and leader, then my friend, we are not living up to our name. And so this morning, Jesus is before us, and he wants us to see that life in his kingdom is to live, to be lived counterculturally in the face of evil, that we are to be people who endure with generosity to our opposers, that relate to our enemies graciously, that, that love all patiently and equally. And when we do, we are imitating our king. We are truly living those words. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? got to learn to live for you. Three questions as we land this plane and park it here. Three questions that I think need to be answered based upon our study. We don't want to just learn this for head knowledge, but we want transformation. And I want to ask, ask him to do this way. Three questions that I hope you jot down and think through and journal out. Based on what we've learned today, number one, how has Jesus influenced your life? How has Jesus influenced your life? I hope you could say Jesus has influenced me in big ways. How has Jesus... Or, how, how does Jesus want to influence that relational tension you're going through right now? He has something to say about retaliation, about retribution. How has Jesus influenced your life? If you look back on your life and you've never really seen Jesus influence your life, he wants to influence your life. And this morning you can begin to have him influence your life by putting your faith in him, by believing that he is the savior of the world. By believing that you're not good enough to get to heaven on your own merit. That you cannot become religion, religious enough in order to earn your way to heaven. It's impossible. You have a sin. I have sin. We've committed a sin. That sin deserves judgment. But Jesus took our judgment upon himself and he paid for our sin. And if we will believe in Jesus Christ, then his blood will be the covering for our sin. And he'll credit back to your account his perfect righteousness. To where death no longer is feared. Sin is no longer holding you captive. You are released. No longer under the condemnation of sin. You are now under his grace and mercy. He wants to influence your life today and be your Lord. Number two, who are you excluding from your love? Who are you excluding from your love? Who do you find your love exclusively being given to? Is it people that are like you? People that treat you like you want to be treated? People that think like you? People that vote like you? People that look like you? 
people that have your morals, people that are always kind to you? Who are you excluding from your love? Number three, who do you need to forgive and repay with kindness? Bitterness is like, treat, bitterness is like drinking poison and expecting it to kill your enemy. It's only killing you. Who do you need to forgive and repay with kindness? And I know this, Christ never commands us to do something that he does not empower us to already do. He empowers you to be this. So admit today, I need your help, Jesus. If this is what you're calling to me be, I need your help. And when we pursue it, he is glorified with our lives. And our lives are living submissively to our king. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you so much for your goodness and grace.